Hey everybody, John Mark here. Before we get started, I just wanna give you a heads up that today's interview is with Dr. Nancy Piercy, who is a professor and Christian intellectual who's written a brilliant book called Love Thy Body, which is hands down one of the best books and resources I have come across on the world view behind the sex revolution that we have been living through in Western culture. But in this interview, we go right into it and we address subjects like abortion, transgenderism, gender dysphoria, sexual assault. And I just wanna give you a heads up to make sure that you're ready to hold space for this conversation. And I still wanna put this on the internet even at the cost to myself, because this is an important conversation. It's not just about our sexuality, it is about our humanity. So I hope you find this conversation as helpful as I did. Actually, the secular liberal view that has a low view of the human being, and especially of the human body. One of my students put it this way once. She said, growing up in the church, I was always taught spirit good, body bad. And I reverse that in Love My Body. I show that no, it's actually Christianity that has a very high view of the body. Dr. Piercy, thank you so much for your time. It is my honor to sit down with you. How are you doing today? Thank you, John Mark. I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, it's really a joy to have you on. I quote you in my most recent book as saying, what Christians do with their sexuality is one of the most important testimonies they give to the surrounding world. That, that quote was helpful for me, um, just to let you into a little bit of my back process. I had, as we were editing uh, this book, I had all these mixed emotions because I kept coming back to sexuality in particular as the best example of kind of the thesis of my book and as transgenderism in particular as really the best case study. But I felt bad for like, you know, it kind of felt like I was harping on this issue over and over. And I have a great editor who was kind of really after me to broaden my examples. And I was really working at that. And, you know, you hear the critique a lot that Christians are obsessed with sex and have a negative view of sex. But the more I think, and reading your book was beyond helpful, the more I read and research kind of where the sexual revolution came from at a philosophical level, like it did not appear out of nowhere. The sexual revolution did not cause the sexual revolution. It came from somewhere. And the more I kind of understand the origin source of it, as far as the philosophers behind it and the leading thinkers, the more I realize we're not the ones who are obsessed with sex. It's Western culture that is obsessed with culture, with sex at an unprecedented level, arguably in human history. And you would argue, if I'm reading your book right, has a pretty negative view. So your book was so helpful because your book does something that very few Christian books on sexuality and gender do in that it's less of a biblical theology, though it's shot full of biblical theology. But you're, as I, as I read your book, you are working to help people understand the worldview behind the sex revolution we've been living in for half a century now or more, and the redefinition of kind of human sexuality and gender and so many other things. So kind of opening question to you, because there's so much here. Uh, wh why would you write a book like this one right now in my hands? Like you're sticking your neck out on the line. I'm sure you have, it's a beautiful book. It's so well written. It is blisteringly smart but why would you stick your neck out on the line? There's so many other things you could write about and just let somebody else deal with this. Like, why did you write this book? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked um, because you're right. It, the, in Love Thy Body, I do take a very different approach. I look at the worldview you know, behind that biblical ethic. It's kind of like the reasons behind the rules. You know, we can't not just tell people the Bible says. There has to be a reason behind it. You know, what, is, what is it about the human person that makes this ethic fit who we are. You have to go beyond. And, and you ask, why did I pick up this particular topic? Um, <laughs> as I tell people sometimes, I can't answer that question because it's too personal. <laughs> um, in other words, there were people in my life, very close to me and my family, who were struggling with this. And I, I, a lot of my readers, of course, it's the same thing. The people who take my class at, a, at Houston Baptist University where I teach, 
almost invariably the people who come and take my classes, I have a class specifically on this book and invariably at least half the class, it's because they have, they have sons or daughters, they have um, siblings, you know, brothers or sisters, they have a husband or a wife who, who's dealing with these issues. So this, these are issues, um, yeah, I, I should back up and just say that Love Thy Body covers cutting edge moral issues like abortion, euthanasia, homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, the hookup culture, and so on. And so invariably, people are dealing with these issues on a very personal level. And that's what uh, was the most unique about this book as opposed to my other books. You know, I've written other books on apologetics and how do we know Christianity is true and what is the Christian worldview and what does it mean to have a Christian worldview on all of life, you know, every area of life, not just the, it's not just religious truth, it's truth about all of life. These are my common themes in all of my books. What made this book different is that I was dealing with issues that a lot of people were having to handle on a very personal level. So yeah, I was very, um, I felt very honored that these people told me their stories. The book is not just a lot of moral reasoning. It's full of stories. And it's, it's when you read it, did you notice how many times I said, a student of mine? <laughs> yes, there's a lot of students of yours, for sure. <laughs> so you're saying it was born, you know, this isn't an ideological book for you. It was born out of your pers personal and professorial experience of working with people and even in your own family, in your own story, in your own life, autobiography. But it is an idea book, not ideological, but it is an idea book. And one of, one mm -hmm. of the things that I had to learn the hard way as a pastor teaching who has a responsibility to pastor people in all of life, including their sexuality, is whenever I teach on sexuality to realize that long before sexuality is a moral issue, it is an anthropological issue. Meaning it's not that, you know, the, the secular world and the Christian world have a different moral vision. They do, but they're based on radically different understandings of what it means to be a human being. And so your book does a great deep dive into that. You kind of frame your book with this concept from philosophy that I was ignorant of called personhood theory that you kind of identify as the through line through kind of the entire sex revolution from hookup culture and pornography to abortion, euthanasia you put in there that was really interesting, which made perfect sense. And uh, of course, all things LGBTQ and transgender identities. Explain to us what is personhood theory, um, because most of us, I'm guessing, have no idea what that is, and how does it apply? Right. Um, so you, you're right. This this is what precedes any moral discussion is, is what does it mean to be a human being? And I wrote Love Their Body in order to help people to see um, that uh, to cut through some sort of the negative messages we usually so associate with Christianity. A lot of people think um, Christianity is, is just about don't do it. It's a sin. It's wrong. It's against the Bible. And there's something wrong with you. That's the message I think a lot of people connect to Christianity. And so that was a, a major reason I wrote the book was to turn the tables and to yes. show that it's actually the secular liberal view that has a low view of the human being and especially of the human body, which is surprising to many people because they think, you know, it's Christians who don't care about this world, you know, the physical world, you know, our bodies, all that matters is our soul, our spirit. Uh, as one of my, my students put it this way once, she said, growing up in the church, I was always taught spirit good, body bad. And I reverse that in Love Thy Body. I show that, no, it's actually Christianity that has a very high view of the body and the dignity, value, and significance of the human body. So it's sometimes easier if we make it concrete. And let, me just, so let me just jump in with uh, the example where it's easiest to see. And it, it's also, of course, the most uh, cutting edge issue of our day, which is transgenderism. Transgender activists explicitly argue that your gender identity has nothing to do with your biological sex, that your identity as male or female is not part of your authentic self. A BBC documentary put it this way. It said, at the heart of the debate is the idea that your mind can be at war with your body. And in that war, it's the mind that wins. Right? Your body is not an important part of who you are. Uh, there's, there have been um, newspaper articles recently um, about how schools are teaching transgenderism down to, down to kindergarten 
right? Kids are being estranged from their own bodies. Uh, parents are reporting that kids are coming home, you know, even from kindergarten and first grade, saying things like, my teacher said, that just because you have girl parts doesn't mean you're a girl. Just because you have boy parts doesn't mean you're a boy. So biology is being, they're, be, they're being taught that biology does not matter. It's not really part of who they are. Um, it's, it's gone all the way down to um, newborns. Have, I'm sure you've heard of gender neutral parenting. Gender neutral parenting is where you don't tell your, your child whether they're a boy or a girl. And uh, I looked it up. There's a Facebook page for gender neutral parenting. And it says point blank. This is a direct quote. There is no such thing as biological sex. Oh, yeah, sure, we have bodies and chromosomes and genitals and so on, but that's a social construction. To call it sex is a social construction. And then it warned that anybody who uh, posted something about biological sex, if you even referred to the phrase biological sex, your post would be flagged. So that's where we are today is that the people can claim just outright, there is no such thing as biological sex. And our response to that should be, you know, from a Christian worldview perspective, is why accept such a demeaning view of the body? Christianity says your body is, is the handiwork of God. It is an important part of who you are. It has dignity and value because God made it. What God makes is intrinsically good. And so our response should be to come back with an understanding that the Bible gives great dignity and value to the human body, as opposed to, I think, you know, what we're known for is having a more negative message. Oh, something's wrong with you. That, that's that's you know, what you're doing is bad. No, we should be coming back with, our goal is to help you love your body, respect your body, honor your body, uh, you know, as a handiwork of a loving God. So that's that's the, the theme of loving body is helping people to make that shift in their long, in their language. Yeah, I mean, I, it was really arresting. I mean, it's in the title, Love Thy Body, which almost sounds like it would be from like a secular progressive feminist or something, you know? And then uh, Culture Shock, it's, it's very much a different kind of track. Chapter one is titled, I Hate Me, The Rise and Decline of the Human Body. In it, you write about, quote, the deeply dehumanizing worldview at the heart of abortion, assisted suicide, homosexuality, transgenderism, and the sexual chaos of the hookup culture. Dehumanizing is a really strong word that is most of the time used by progressives, not by conservatives, and I'm, I'm not even sure where you identify along that spectrum. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that actually, and this is 100% my conviction, and I think this goes back to Paul in Corinthians, when the Corinthians are saying, you know, food for the body and body for the food, and, you know, and they have this very low view of sexuality as kind of just play for grown-ups, just this biological release, just hedonistic pleasure. It's no different than eating or drinking or sleeping or any other bodily appetite. And actually, Paul's theology, based on his reading of the book of Genesis, is a much higher view of human sexuality, that we are engendered creatures in the image of God, and, you know, that sexuality is is far more than just a kind of biological release. So is that what I'm hearing you say, that Actually, even if some people growing up in certain corners of, say, evangelicalism kind of imbibed this message, spirit good, body bad, that's actually not Christian teaching. That's a perversion of Christian teaching by some Christians in America. And actually, Christian teaching has a higher view of the body, whereas the Western kind of secular view is a, in your language, dehumanizing view. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I do use the word dehumanizing. I'm glad you picked up on that one. Um, and I agree with you. I, I wrote also uh, on how Western culture tends to treat sexuality as almost like a, an appetite. You know, if you yes. feel the appetite, you fulfill it, no big deal. It's the, it's the no big deal version of sexuality. Yes. I call we it, hear that language all the time here. Yeah. Because um, what's the chapter in Proverbs where it talks about the, the woman who's committed adultery and it says she wipes her mouth and says, I have done nothing wrong. You know, wiping her mouth, having the image of, you know, fulfilling an appetite. Um, and and the, the irony is that young, young, young people know the script all too well, but they don't necessarily like it. In Love Thy Body, I quote several very poignant quotes from, from college students, like uh, a young woman named Alicia, who said, hookups are very scripted. This is a direct quote. Hookups are very scripted. You learn to turn everything off 
accept your body. You make yourself emotionally invulnerable. Wow. And I thought, I mean, and she didn't like that, but she was just saying, this is how it works. So what us. should be the greatest example of intimacy, vulnerability, self-giving instead is dehumanized where you have to actually emotionally shield yourself. And instead it just becomes this bodily, you know, co coopulating. Actually, I have a quote from a, uh, a drummer in Austin, Texas, who literally says, sex is just a piece of body touching another piece of body. It is existentially meaningless. So there you go. This is not a high view of sexuality. Or as right. another, uh, another young college student that I quote, you know, I read a lot of Rolling Stone magazine when I was writing this book. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do a lot of read when you're writing about stuff like this. You do. I did the same and nowhere near as deep as you, but you do a lot of weird research. I, I read a lot of people that have a very different worldview than my own. Yeah, I know. It's great, isn't it? The and I'm always like open minded, like win me over. And it all, oh. nine times out of 10, it does the exact opposite. Like, man, this if you if you follow the logic down the rabbit hole, I mean, you end up with Nietzsche. I mean, this is just like a really dark yes. place. But another the another Rolling Stone quote was from a young woman and again, a college student who said the mistake people make is that they think there's two there's, there's two dimensions to a relationship, one sexual and one emotional. And they pretend like there are clean lines between them. And so there's that dichotomy that you, that you started out with at the beginning of the interview between the person and the body. Essentially, that, that was a good example of how even sexuality has been divided into you know, my, my body is so separate from my person, you know, that I, I, I don't interact with somebody as a whole person. And, and that's what and that's what we would have against it, of course, is that you, like you said a minute ago, you don't interact with the whole person. Right. And I, you know, I, I care a lot about Christian spirituality and I also love the world of psychology, which is all about how do you integrate, or at least it used to be, how do you integrate to your body? How do you come to peace with your story, with your past, with your future? How, you know, people that we look up to and respect are people who are integrated, who are at peace. We love, we're drawn to people who are at home in their own bodies, who are at peace with their personality and their quirks and idiosyncrasies and who find joy in living life as it actually is, not as they wish it was. These are the people that as human beings, religious or not, Christian or atheist, we're drawn to people like that. There's a compelling beauty to people like that. So just can you define in a sentence or two personhood theory? You, we move to an example. I, I think my understanding is I think you're saying that personhood theory is this Western worldview that says the person who you really are, your authentic self in street language, is, is different from your body. Your body is almost just this like meat sack to carry your personhood around. It's, that's a crass crass uh, attempt to articulate, but is, is that, give us in a sentence or two, what is personhood theory? Yes, but it's not that crass. That's how some scientists talk about it. There's a very famous scientist who uh, was the head of the artificial intelligence lab at MIT, who wrote a book in which he said, a, a human being is just, quote, a big bag of skin full of biomolecules interacting by the laws of physics and chemistry. So what you said is exactly what many of our leading scientists are saying these days, that your body has so little value that it's just a, 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 bio, a complex biochemical machine, um, totally, totally operating by you know, natural laws. And somehow your personhood then, uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's completely separate. And the only, the only way you can conceptualize this is almost to have a mental dichotomy. And to say, okay, yes. body is over here operating by natural laws. And over here, you know, quite separate is who you are as a person. And it's somehow not governed in any way by, by your body or by your, you know, phys yes. your physical sexuality. But uh, I like the way you use the word integration. I use that word, especially when I talk about homosexuality, because it has, a, it, it's, has the same worldview, um, the same demeaning of the body, the same separation. Um, here's, here's how I'd put it. Even my homosexual friends agree that uh, when it comes to biology, physiology, anatomy, chromosomes, males and females are counterparts to one another. 
that is how the human sexual and reproductive system is designed. To adopt, to embrace a same-sex identity is therefore to contradict that design. It's to say, in essence, why should my body affect my personal identity? Why should my biological sex, biological sex as male or female have any say in my moral choices, in my relationships? And so we have to help people to see that that's a profoundly disrespectful view of the body. It's basically saying that um, my, my body, like you said a minute ago, I'm alienated from my body. It's self-division. It's the same war that people talk about with transgenderism. There's still a war between my body and my mind, and it's, and it's the mind that counts. It's the mind that can override your biological identity. So this is extreme self-alienation, self-division. And we, we, we need to be able to commend the Christian worldview then as a way of bringing unity and inner harmony and inner wholeness. Um, uh, uh, there was a, one of the stories I tell in the book is a young woman named Jean who lived as a lesbian for many years and today is married and has two children. And she, get, she wrote an article about her, why she changed. And she said, and this is a direct quote, I came to, I came to accept trust. That's how she said, I came to trust that God had made me female for a reason. And I wanted to honor my body by living in accord with the creator's design. So it's that positive language. I wanna honor my body. I wanna respect my biological sense. I wanna live in accord with the creator's design. That's, that's the language of self, self um, integration and wholeness. That's the language that we should be using yes. when we talk to people about sexuality. I mean, I can't think of a better word than your title, love, love thy body, you know? Chapter two on your book is maybe another very hard to talk about um, at a, multiple levels, but and emotionally loaded, but example of this in action um, through abortion, you know? And both of us in our books quote that British journalist, Antonia Senor, who writes about her kind of story as a you know very staunch pro-choice liberal ad advocate to becoming a mother, which which forced her at some level to admit the reality that life begins at conception. So she writes this: any other conclusion is a convenient lie. We on the pro-choice side of the debate tell ourselves to make us feel better about the action of taking a life. But then she goes on to say. Yes, abortion is killing, but it's the lesser evil. Explain to us the logic behind something like that, where killing a child, another human being, in the moral calculus of the sex revolution is considered a lesser evil than a woman not having the, quote, freedom to have sex without bearing children. Help us understand the worldview behind that. Yes, I, it really comes back again to the personhood theory that you started with. Um, there's another story in the book. Uh, again, another journalist, by the way. And your book, by the way, is you are a brilliant writer. It is just full of, it's like one part like intellectual download and the other part just story after story after story. It, it really brings it to life, doesn't it? Like, like this was another journalist who uh, said she had always been proudly pro-choice, those her words, until she got pregnant with her first baby. And then she began to struggle. And she said, I was, I, was calling, I was calling the life inside me a baby because I wanted it. But if I hadn't wanted it, I would think of it as just a group of cells that it was okay to kill. And to her credit, she realized that didn't make sense. You know, a fetus doesn't become a baby just because somebody wants it. And uh, being a journalist, she actually began to research this. Um, and eventually, she, she, here's where she settled. She said, in terms of the science, it's clear that life does begin at conception. But, she said, morally speaking, the fact of life is not so important. It's, it's, what's important is whether it starts to become a person. So that was a very dramatic example of the difference between human and personhood. Yeah, so being a human yes. does not make you a person. 
according to personhood theory. And so theory. it's not really human rights, it's person rights. It is. And then comes the mother of all questions, how do you decide who is a person? If it's no longer, well, this is a human being at whatever age or stage, how do you decide who is a person? Right, it used to be biological, right? If you are biologically human, you were in. You are a person. You are a person. All humans were persons. Even if you are born with special needs or it doesn't matter, you are a person. Right. That people did not used to make the distinction between being a human and being a person. And the only reason people do make the distinction now, it started with bioethicists, you know, professional bioethicists who wanted to get around the science. There is a pe most people don't know this, but you will not find really any professional bioethicist today who deny that the fetus is human from conception. You know, the, the, the evidence from science, from genetics and DNA is just too strong to deny it. Just read any embryology textbook. So how do they get around the science in order to support abortion? Well, they do this two-story this two, uh, two division. I use the imagery of two stories in a building, you know, to express this dichotomy between the body and the person. So in the, in the lowest story, you have the body and everyone, including secular bioethicists, will agree, agree that biologically, physiologically, you know, in terms of chromosomes and DNA, the fetus is human from conception. But they say at some point, it climbs up into the upper story, to use the two-story two metaphor, and becomes a person usually defined in terms of mental capacities, some level of cognitive functioning, self-awareness, and so on. And I'm, I'm sure you, uh, already you can see what the problem is, which is yes. how do you define personhood then? You know, what about elderly people? What about special needs people? What about people with Down syndrome? What about people, yeah. Or even staying with, lower, with abortion. Lower IQ, it, yes. It, even just staying with abortion. Uh, some bioethicists will say, well, the fetus becomes a human before birth. You know, so as, as soon as right. it's born, it's okay. Other bioethicists today will say no. Uh, not until after birth, even famous ones. No, like yeah. Craig, you, Peter, you, you quote Peter Singer in and the then book, Peter who Singer. is, he's Princeton Seminary, right? Like world-renowned bioethicist who's basically making a case for, quote, after birth abortion up to right. three days after, oh, no, because there three, are some- Oh, three years. No, three days is Francis, Francis uh, Crick and Watson. The, the discoveries of the DNA, uh, the double helix structure of DNA, that's yes. Crick and Watson. They are both on record saying three days. In other words, some the rationale being that some birth defects don't show up until after birth. And so yeah, you, you even talk about the number yeah. of people that abort their babies due to club foot. And then I didn't realize I this, but apparently the Olympic figure skater, uh, who was it? Christy Christ Yamaguchi Christy. was born yeah. with a club foot. Yeah. So, so the logic there is you wait three days till after birth because there are some birth defects or abnormalities that don't show up until after birth. And People are arguing for a legal right to terminate that that body because it's not a person. It's not a person. Yes, area. you do three days of genetic testing, in other words. And, and who if it is passes, saying if it passes three the test, years? Oh yeah. So Peter Singer said he literally on his website he had a you know a, a FAQ um, web a statement on his website, and he said even three years of age is a gray case. That's that was his words. It's a gray case. After all, how much cognitive functioning does a toddler have? So that's right. where we are now. Is that yes? I mean, Peter Singh is at Princeton, as you notice. This is, these are not fringe characters, and no. they're arguing for uh, so-called afterbirth abortion. Now, it's it's so hard for me to even ask you questions about this because the way, and if I was a PR person, I and mean, I would say this is just brilliant, the way the conversation has been framed up it's been framed up as a women's rights issue that therefore, not as a injustice for the vulnerable issue, therefore a man in particular has no right to even comment on it. What, what would you say to that, to that framing of it, to that, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's a tough call because, you know, I do say in Love Their Body that there are two people here. You know, there is the baby and there is the woman. And we don't want to frame it in such a way that we ignore the, that we ignore the woman. Right. But even there, it's much more humane to acknowledge that she's her body is part of who she is. The idea that you can just um, you know, eliminate a pregnancy as though it were just a purely mechanistic uh, action 
ignores the fact that there is an organic natural connection between a woman and her baby. There are arguments for abortion that literally treat the, the, the fetus as a, a trespassing, as a somebody who's breaking the law and trespassing your body, and therefore you have a legal right of self-defense to get rid of this trespassing person. Um, as, instead of acknowledging that pregnancy is an intrinsic part of being female, and that uh, your body, you a mother and baby have a very natural organic connection, and you know even before I was a, if, before I was even a Christian, I didn't become a Christian until I was in college, and um, but I was against abortion even as a non-Christian because it was so obviously unnatural. You know, I I didn't I didn't think it was a I didn't think it was respectful to a woman's body to go in there with harsh chemicals and and sharp instruments. You know, and interrupt a natural process. It's you know, it's not just the baby whose life you're taking. You're also interrupting a very natural, very uh, a function that's very central to who you are as a woman. So I'll I'll like to say I, I agree. We have to make sure that we're also talking. A woman is also in, intrinsically connected to her body. Yes, and we need to respect her her body when she has a biological function like pregnancy. Yes. You know, it's easy to let this conversation slide into, again, an ideological or even just a, uh, an intellectual kind of frame. But for most people, this is about as deeply personal and emotional as it gets. What would you say to somebody listening who is either considering an abortion or who has already had one and is just hearing this in the aftermath? I just had a, I mean, if you're, you're a professor, you're chatting to a 21-year-old in your class or somebody in your family or somebody in your church, what, what would you say to them? Well, I was really happy and grateful that several women did talk to me while I was writing Love Thy Body um, because it made me, it, I, I changed the way I wrote about it to write a whole lot more about the, um, the responsibility of, of the church to minister to women who had had abortions. And there are organizations uh, that are you know, Christian organizations that minister to women who've had abortions. I had, I'll tell you uh, an example. So one of my students, one of my graduate students, um, we were having, I have reading groups on my book manuscripts. This is one way I get feedback. That's why I have so many good stories. I get a lot of feedback because <laughs> I have reading groups. And um, so the, she was in my reading group, but she was also a graduate student. and. Uh, when we were discussing abortion, she said, uh, well, I haven't had one, but, and then she gave her opinion. Two weeks later, she came back and said, I lied. I did have an abortion. I've just never told anyone. She never told anyone. So our little reading group was the first time she'd ever admitted to anyone that she'd had an abortion. And here's how it happened. She was attending a Christian college, not, not mine, a different one. Um, she was attending a Christian college and she'd broken up with her boyfriend and um, she was raped. He came to her door and of course she let him in. It was a former boyfriend. She, she wasn't, uh, she didn't have a guard up. Well, he, he put date rape drug in her drink and, and raped her. Uh, it was revenge rape, basically. He was mad at her for breaking up with him. Mm -hmm. Well, she got pregnant. And she said her first thought was, my family will be shunned by my church. That was her first thought, was how could she protect oh, her family? How tragic. Isn't it? She thought, my family will be shunned. That was her first thought. And she signed up for the first available abortion appointment that she could get. And she's lived with it ever since. She said, I was against abortion at the time, and I still am. So she was so afraid of her church rejecting her family, that her, you know, of her family paying a price, that she did something that was against her own conscience. So, and here's what she said, and, and this, this, was, this is sort of the punchline. She said, the church is more understanding and accepting of a convicted, a convicted felon than they are of a woman who's had an abortion. And I kind of, you know, was taken aback, like, uh, wait, are you exaggerating? She said, think about it. Think of all the prison ministries. Yes. <laughs> We've got yeah. lost dozens and dozens of prison ministries. How many ministries do we have to women who've had abortions? Very few. I mean, I managed to pick 
uh, I managed to find a few to list in my book, um, but they're very small and most churches don't have them. So her point was well taken. The church actually has more com compassion for a convicted felon than they have for a woman who's had an abortion. So that's where we need to work, that we need to work yes. on realizing it, women, women like this student, you know, who was raped, you know, who was just a college student who didn't know where to turn and you know, she, she needs people who will reach out and support her and help her. Yes. We in the church bear some culpability for much of this great tragedy in our time. Yeah. Yeah. What a good call to create a community where that's a safe place for people to come out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, how does this idea of abortion, not to take it out of this personal place and back to the conceptual, but how does this idea of abortion and personhood theory and kind of the idea matrix behind it, what bearing does it have on human rights? I mean, you go into this in the book, you quote Yuval Harari, who's arguably the, the leading atheist of our day right now. You know, his book Sapiens sold, you know, countless copies, brilliant thinker. You know, he's gone on record as calling human rights a, quote, Christian myth. Yeah. And it's not because he's against human rights, but human rights are distinctly born out of a Christian worldview rooted in Genesis chapter one. All human beings are created in the image of God. It is literally the antithesis of Darwinian materialism. You know, that this is, you're just a sack of meat. You're an accident. And it's, you know, it's just about survival of the species. And now that the earth is overpopulated, you know, do whatever you want with your body. Um, and we evolved from the strong preying on the weak. I mean, that's not, that is not an ideological, that's not a worldview that will lead you to human rights. So, so what, what bearing does personhood have on personhood theory and these ideas have on the future of human rights in the West? Uh, and by the way, yeah, Nietzsche said it too. Nietzsche said all, all that Christianity is the source of all theories of human rights, by the way. And uh, yes. contemporary. Yeah, I mean, Nietzsche hated Christianity because he thought it was a way for the weak to yes. manipulate the strong. And he thought it was, you know, I just read um, Tom Holland's book, Dominion, mm -hmm. which was just genius. And he opened, he's not a Christian, he's a historian. And he opens by basically saying that the uh, things that we assume is normal in the West, such as the strong should not prey on the weak, literally had no antecedent in the ancient Greco-Roman world. In fact, it the opposite was assumed, that if it was honorable if you were strong to prey on the weak, it was a sign of just how strong you were. And that you know, he, the subtitle to his book is How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. So, I mean, he, here as a secular agnostic historian is arguing 100% Christian rights is a human, I'm sorry, is a Christian she innovation, has, not a human yeah, one. Yeah, and, and there's another, by the way, another British, I think Holland is British. There's another British philosopher named John Gray, who's written some best-selling books as well. He makes the same argument. He's a uh, he, he says that any concept of human rights is just a derivative of Christianity. Um, but let me back up. I, I wanted to answer that in two ways. I wanted, um, let me start with the more uh, abstract or philosophical side of it. And then let's talk about um, how it plays out in terms of human rights. What I, um, in terms of like, what's the deeper worldview uh, behind it? Your ethics, always derives from your view of nature or science, because after all, your body is part of nature. And so the secular liberal ethic derives from the theory that nature is a product of mindless, purposeless causes, and therefore the body has no intrinsic purpose that we are morally obligated to respect. In fact, oh, and, and therefore the mind can use it any way it wants, which is what you just said. The mind can use it any way it wants because it has no intrinsic purpose of its own. And it's just an accident. It's, it's just accident. meat. It's just a thing. Do whatever you want with it. Uh, Dawkins calls Dawkins calls it a what? A, a meat skeleton. Um, but and and that's actually how homosexuality is defended by the well-known uh, feminist and lesbian Camille Paglia, who I'm sure you've probably read some of her stuff. She's a bit of an iconoclastic feminist because she does not think sex is just a social construction. She says, no, no, no. Nature made us male and female. Humans are a sexually reproducing species. And so then you say, well, then in, in that case, how do you defend being lesbian? And she says, and these are her exact words. She says, well, nature made us male and female, but 
why not defy nature? After all, fate, not God, has given us this flesh. We have absolute claim to our bodies and may do with them as we see fit. So that's the logic. She's basically saying, if our bodies are products of mindless, purposeless forces, then they tell us nothing about who we are. They give us no moral message. and We can do with them as we see fit. And so this is why it's important as Christians to say, okay, wait a minute. According to a Christian worldview, God did create the creation with a purpose. The technical term is teleolo uh, teleological, right? So that, uh, I mean, a very fundamental level, eyes are made for seeing, ears are made for hearing, wings are made for flying, fins are made for swimming, and the entire development of the organism is, built, is, is directed by a built-in plan or, or blueprint. So what Christians are saying then is that even science shows us that nature is teleological. It has a design, a design, a plan, a purpose, an order. And what we're saying is that when we live in harmony with that order, we will be happier and healthier. So, so the, the, the larger, you know, the larger worldview goes all the way back to your view of nature and that our bodies right. do have a plan or a purpose and are not, like you just said, not just meat machines thrown up by chance. It's very important. Which isn't, which isn't actually a scientific worldview. It's, I mean, there's a saying in Portland that's on bumper stickers all over. And we, you know, the, in our America, we believe dot, dot, dot. And there's kind of a list of the progressive slogans, one of which is, we believe science is real. Oh. And that's kind of a, you know, a reaction against some right wing ideology around everything from vaccines to, you know, climate change. But what's bizarre is how anti-science much of the sex revolution is. Yes. An, I mean, it is, it's anti-science, full on, like some of the, the main statements and slogans are not only unscientifically grounded, they're, they're like contradicted by science. Absolutely. So it's, I'm always shocked how secular writers will talk about nature and they'll capitalize the N and they'll almost make nature sound like this, you know, intelligent mind because you, they can't quite talk about what it means to be human and the, the telos of what it means to be human because the, there's so much design and intention and intricacy woven into the human body without talking about nature as if it's a sentient being. Yeah, it, well, in some ways, it's, this is the postmodern mind. You know, modernism says you're just, you're just a complex biochemical machine, but postmodernism is what focuses on, no, your mind is what counts, your, your emotions, yes. your sense of self. So that postmodern view. And, and, and I, I wanted to answer your question about human rights um, in a little more detail, too, because you cannot have a free society unless you acknowledge that some rights are pre-political. That means the government, yeah. the state does not create them. It really recognizes them. And many of our pre-political rights are based in biology. And so yes. as we give like up the biology. Parent, the parent-child relationship, example, which the state doesn't create, it recognizes. But let, let me show you how we're losing that, though. So, so take abortion. The right to life used to be based on the idea that anyone who's biologically human has the most fundamental right of all, which is the right not to be killed. But in Roe v. Wade, the abortion, the Supreme Court abortion decision in 1973, the, the court ruled that some humans, namely the fetus, which we acknowledge is human, some humans are not persons worthy of protecting their life legally. So, in, so the state has arrogated to itself the authority to decide which humans qualify as persons not based on biology, because it's not based on being biologically human, but just on its own say-so. It's just on its own legal fiat. Or take, um, take um, marriage. Marriage is a pre-political right, because human beings, men and women, naturally come together and form families. Humans are a sexually reproducing species. But in order to give same-sex people exactly the same rights as opposite-sex people, the state had to deny the biological component of marriage and say it's just an emotional connection, which is what it did in its Obergefell decision, 
when it legalized same-sex marriage, it says, well, it's just, an, you know, it's just an emotional connection. The trouble is we have lots of emotional connections. So who decides which ones count as marriage? Well, the state basically arrogated to itself the right to decide which ones count as marriage, not based on biology. And so not based on anything objective, just based on its own say-so. Or uh, parenthood, which you just mentioned, parenthood. It used to be, well, from time immemorial, uh, people thought parenthood was based on biology. You know, the, the, the woman who bore the child was the mother and her legal husband was considered the biological father. Uh, this was called the presumption of parenthood. And same-sex couples could obviously could adopt, but until recently, the same sex, the, the same sex partner who was not biologically related to the child, their name did not go on the birth certificate. But same sex advocates said that's not fair, that's discrimination. We should be treated exactly the same as opposite sex couples. And in 2017, the court agreed and passed a ruling saying that as long as the same sex couple was legally married, the non bio the the parent who is not biologically related still got to be on the birth certificate. So now parenthood is not related to biology. The legal definition of parenthood now is something that the state creates and grants. So you've technically, are you are not the parent of your children unless the parent, unless the state says you are. And then of course, transgenderism. Uh, again, since forever, people have thought that your gender was organically and naturally connected to your biological sex. But the only way the state can treat a trans woman, that is someone born male, the same as a biological woman, is to say that biology doesn't matter. And that's what the state did, and the Supreme Court did in its 2020 Bostock decision. It said that Title VII now means uh, gender and not just sex. And that, this, that it treated gender as a state of mind that has nothing to do with your biology, and it says that you get legal rights based on your gender, not your sex. So essentially, uh, and, and who decides that? You know, the state, since it's not rooted, there, therefore it's not rooted in anything objective. So one after another, these yeah. three political rights that were rooted in biology, rooted in science, are no longer rooted in biology. And they, be, and what, they become, what? They become they, it's been a huge gra power grab by the state. The state now tells you, you know, if you have the right to life, you know, if you're married, if you're a parent, and so on. What can of worms does that open up in the arena of human rights? Like, what's the domino effect there if you follow it out? Well, then you don't have, you don't have any inalienable rights. You know, the idea that we had inalienable rights was uh, based on pre-political rights. It's, pre it's, it's inalienable because the state doesn't create it. The state merely recognizes it. So, for example, the right to life up until Roe v. Wade basically was, you have a right to life just because you're human. You're a member of the human race. You have a right not to be killed. And the state's job was to protect that right. It didn't create it. It just recognized and protects it. But now, technically, you know, we, it hasn't worked itself all the way out yet. But logically speaking, the state has now said, no, just because you're human doesn't mean you have a right to life. No. You don't have an inalienable right to life. You now have a right to life only if the state says you do. And I tell people this, you know, when I speak on my book, I, you know, I tell people, you have to realize you, you think you have a right to life just because you're human. But technically, according to the Supreme Court, you don't. You have the right to life only if the state decides you qualify as a person. So that's how it, and it, it impacts And again, rights. you know, you're not fear mongering or trying to scare people or work people up into anger. You're trying to help people understand the worldview behind something like Roe v. Wade or these other multiple examples. And it does have implications for human rights. I mean, one that you point out in the book that was a new idea to me, it was really interesting to have you list euthanasia in this list of the sexual evolution. But it makes perfect sense if a, a child in the womb or a fetus, as it's called, because we have to dehumanize it, I think, in order to emotionally detach from what it is, what abortion is, if that is not deserving of human rights, then why wouldn't your 82-year-old grandmother with dementia, 
you know, like what, what is to protect her? So, you know, you quote a number of left-leaning thinkers that are starting to publicly argue for a version of euthanasia. I mean, talk to us about that. Is that one potential human rights problem that you see on the horizon? Yes, and I like the way you, you, you bring it back to the logic. You know, that's what I want people to see, that, um, that the re one reason we want to talk about it in worldview terms is so that you recognize that these things uh, are, are logically connected. <laughs> So yes. if abortion is based on the idea that you're human, but you're not a person until you acquire certain cognitive functions. Euthanasia is the same reasoning, just in reverse. Namely, if you lose, lose certain cognitive functioning, if you are mentally disabled, then you are no longer a person. It's kind of like it goes backwards, right? It's just the reverse. And so at that point, you will read bioethicists who will say you are only a body. That's a phrase I saw when I was doing the research. Oh, it's, you know, once you've lost certain cognitive function, you are only a body. And at that point, your treatment can be withheld. Your food and water can be withdrawn. Um, your organs can be harvested. Um, and Because you are no longer considered a person. So absolutely, it, it's the same worldview and the same logic, just in reverse. And it has the same dangers that you pointed out is that, well, then who decides? Who decides what the person is? If it's no longer linked to something objectively like biology. Um, I'm, I'm preparing a talk for a, a political organization next weekend. And so I'm, I'm being a little bit more um, forthright and saying Christianity is pro-science. <laughs> it's pro-biology, <laughs> pro pro-science, pro-facts, pro-truth. Yeah. But, that's, but it's true. We're the ones arguing for biology in all of these areas. Every one of them, from abortion, euthanasia, transgenderism, homosexuality, we're all saying it's, it's your biology that matters. Your body counts. Your, your body is a product. Your body, we're arguing your body is a handiwork of God and has great value and dignity. And it, I, I have to, I sometimes have to take people back to in history, you know, the early church faced a similar challenge. The early church faced an, uh, a culture that had a very low view of the body, though for very different reasons. You know, it was because of philosophies like Gnosticism and Platonism and Manichaeism. Do you remember Augustine was a Manichae? These were all du dualistic worldviews that treated the physical material realm as a realm of death, decay, and destruction and treated the spiritual realm as superior. And you know, we wanted, the salvation was to escape from the material world. Plato called the body the prison house of the soul, and the goal was to escape from it. And so in this context, Christianity was nothing short of revolutionary. It said, uh, well, I should add this, Gnosticism teaches that there were several levels of deity, and it was the lowest level deity who created this world. It was an evil god who created this world because no self-respecting God would get his hands dirty mucking about with matter. So it was very, it was, it was revolutionary when Christians said, no, 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 it's the highest God who made this world. It was a good God who made this world. And so this world is intrinsically good. And, and then the greatest scandal actually at the time was the, the incarnation. The idea that that same supreme deity had actually entered into the material realm and taken on a physical right. body, you know, to, to the Greeks, this was this was uh, th this was the greatest scandal, actually, of the Christian message at the time. And of course, when Jesus was executed on a Roman cross, we could say he did escape from the physical body, as Gnosticism taught we should aspire to do. But what did he do then? <laughs> he came back, he came back to it in yes. a physical body. To the ancient Greeks, this was not spiritual progress. It was like the ultimate validation of the human body, of biology, of personhood, of matter, of the earth, of the goodness of God's creation. And Paul says the, the idea of a physical res resurrection was out of foolishness to the Greeks. Yes. First Corinthians. We, we don't always and know what that- And this dueling worldview mm -hmm. had massive fallout for sexuality, right? Because, I mean, the more I understand Greco-Roman sexuality, it mm -hmm. was, on one hand, way farther left than anything in our country right now, like as far as what was open. And it was also full of sexual assault and it was full of massive abusive practices, in particular toward women, children, and slaves. And that was what was created by this 
ideological worldview that said the body doesn't matter, material doesn't matter, the body's a prison house of the soul, which is diametrically opposed to the Christian worldview in which Jesus was resurrected in a body. Oh, and, and at the end of times, here's where Christians sometimes are, are unclear too. At the end of time, what's going to happen? We're not going to be floating around in the clouds in, you know, in the ether. God says he's going to create a new, her, new heavens and a new earth. And we will live on that new earth in, in uh, resurrected bodies. You know, from the time of the Apostles' Creed, Christians have affirmed the resurrection of the body for all of us. So this is an extraordinarily high view of the physical world. There's nothing like it in any other philosophy or religion. As Christians, we should be so excited, so happy you know, that we are just, you know, it's just overflowing from us. You know, how, yes. That this is such a wonderful view, such a positive view, such an affirming view that, it, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you just want to give the good news. You know, Francis Schaeffer used to say the gospel doesn't start with Jesus died for your sins. The gospel starts with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, because that's what tells us that this earth, this life has meaning. And, and he said, it is very good. And it's very good. And, and people say, oh, yeah, but what about sin? What about sin in the fall? Well, but the Bible never teaches that sin has totally obliterated God's original good creation. We're still made in God's image. And it's like uh, it's, it's as if a child took a, you know, a, a magic marker and, and scribbled on the Mona Lisa or something. You could still see the beauty of the original masterpiece shining through. And that's the Christian view of sin is that, uh, and the fall, is that you can still see the beauty of God's original creation shining through. We, you know, we still honor God's handiwork if, uh, in spite of the fall. You know, we're realistic about evil and sin, but that doesn't mean that we overlook the, the goodness of creation. You know, the Christian worldview is creation, fall, redemption. I'm sure you've heard that breakdown. You yes. Know, we acknowledge the goodness of creation. We acknowledge, though, it was, it was damaged by the fall. So we're, we're utterly realistic about sin and evil. And then we look to God to show us how we can be a redemptive force in bringing it back to the way God originally created it. So we, a balanced Christian worldview has all three. We don't. Yes. The, the typical revivalist message starts with the fall. It's a, you're a sinner. You need to get saved. Well, yeah, but if you don't start with creation, you don't know yes. what sin is. You don't know why it's a problem. <laughs> And you lose the dignity of the human being because I, I've had students, I've had students said that that's what they grew up with. They grew up with, you're nobody, you're, you're nothing, you're evil, you're corrupt, you know, because you're a sinner was like the starting point. It's right. not the starting point. The starting point is you have great value and beauty and dignity because you're made in God's image. And if you don't have that, sin isn't, sin isn't even a tragedy. I mean, the reason it's a tragedy is because you have such beauty and dignity to start with. It's like a, if you had a cheap trinket and it broke, it's like, so what? You know, throw it out. But if you have a great masterpiece that gets damaged, that's a tragedy. Yes. So the only reason sin is a tragedy is because we have such value and dignity to start with. Wow. What a beautiful starting point for the Christian message. In closing, you know, a lot of people, this is on the internet, so anybody can listen. But a lot of the people listening to this podcast series and reading my book are are and books like yours are people who love and follow Jesus and are trying to figure out how to do that in a city like Portland or wherever they call home in this like increasingly secular and increasingly progressive kind of culture where this issue of sexuality and gender is it's not like a issue it's like the predominant one and we now, as followers of Jesus, have the immoral position. Like, I'm just old enough to remember when the Christian sex ethic was weird. You know, it's like, oh, that's weird. You don't sleep together before marriage. Or that's weird. You don't live together with your girlfriend. Or that's weird. You don't have an affair. Or don't get a divorce, even if you're not happy in your marriage. That's weird. Now, it's not weird. It's immoral. It's dangerous. It's an example of bigotry or repression or oppression or whatever. And that is a very hard like social stigma for a lot of people to carry. It's not persecution in the sense of violence, thank God. And at this point, it's not a legal discrimination. But it is a hard emotional weight for a lot of people to carry, to, to hold to a vision uh, of Jesus and of the writers of the New Testament and of the Orthodox global historic church 
of what it means to be human, what it means to be engendered, what it means to be sexual, that I, I think is a compelling vision. If I just had the Bible and the Christian worldview, you know, and some Christian intellectuals helping to explain it to me, I would just think, man, this is beautiful. But in the wider culture that is screaming at us, no, that's immoral, it can be hard to carry that. So what, in closing, what would you say to those who love and follow Jesus and are trying to figure out how, how to hold his vision in this kind of a, a cultural current? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, even more generally about the Christian worldview, be, even beyond sexuality, and um, I have to tell you, it's something that I uh, wonder about how to make real to other people. I was not, uh, I was raised Christian, but it was um, I was raised in a Lutheran home. I don't know if you know this, but you know all 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 Scandinavians are Lutheran in the way that all Irish are Catholic. Yes. Right. And so it was very much an ethnic. British or Anglican. Yeah, it was the state church, right? After oh, yeah. After the Reformation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I, th- that's what I was raised at, where, where, where the Christianity was. It wasn't, that was not, let me, well, I'll, I'll say, I'll, it was, there was no personal, <laughs> there was no personal reality. <laughs> there was no personal reality. Okay. I'm going to talk about this in my next book. My father was severely physically abusive. So here I had this guy. Taking us, taking his family to church every Sunday, and then beating us in the during the week. I mean, obviously, goodness, his Christianity was very much discredited in my eyes. <laughs> and yes, in uh, in high school, I, I walked away from my faith entirely, and I, I started saying, "Well, how do I? How do I even know this stuff is true? How do I know this is true?" And I asked my father point blank, "Why are you a Christian?" And he said, "Works for me." I said, "That's it." <laughs> you know? um, and I had a chance to talk to a Lutheran seminary dean, and I thought I'd get a more substantial answer. And all he said was, don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes, as though or a psychological phase that I was going through. And so eventually I decided, well, maybe Christianity just didn't have any answers. And I very intentionally walked away from my Christian upbringing and started on a search for truth. I decided, I guess it was up to me. I'd have to figure out, you know, I would have to survey all the religions and philosophies of the world and figure out which one was true, which was a pretty big ambition for a 16 year old. But I literally started walking down the hallway at the public high school I attended and pulling books off the philosophy shelf. Because I thought, well, isn't this what philosophers are supposed to say? You know, they, don't they deal with what is truth? How do we know it? Is there a foundation for ethics or is it just, you know, true for me, true for you? You know, is there a purpose to life? Um, and I pretty quickly decided that if, if there was no God, the answer to all of those questions was no, no, it's not a foundation for ethics. Uh, there is, you know, I became a complete moral relativist. I was the one in my friend group who was arguing for moral relativism. You know, a, a friend of mine speaking about a, a mutual friend, I said, oh, she's so wrong. And I jumped on her and said, you can't say anyone's right or wrong. <laughs> um, I even became a complete skeptic because I realized if all I have is my puny brain and the vast scope of time and history and space, the idea that I could know absolute universal objective truth, is ridiculous. I, that's how I thought, you know, as a 16 year old, it seemed to me obviously ridiculous that I could know any kind of real truth. So in fact, I, I remember doodling on my page and on a paper in an English class, the whole universe is a thought bubble in my own head. You know, I w- that's all I knew really, what was in my own head. So you can see that I was very primed to eventually end up at the ministry of Francis Schaeffer at Labrie, which is in Switzerland, um, which is an apologetics ministry. Labrie is uh, French for the shelter. And Francis Schaeffer was a an apolog- Christian apologist who, to, who had a, a particularly effective ministry to young, to disaffected young people. And at that time, mostly hippies. <laughs> we were all hippies. Um, and a, a lot of his hippies were hitchhiking their way across Europe, trying to find themselves. And I was, we had lived in Europe when I was a child. So I had gone back and that's how I kind of had ended up st- stumbling across Labrie and Switzerland. Anyway, so the first, that, that was the first time I ever heard of anything, any kind of Christian apologetics. I had no, no idea that Christianity could be supported by good reasons and evidence and arguments. 
I had no idea that you could, you know, give good reasons. You know, that it, Christians that always treated me like, like there was, I had some moral problem. You, know, you don't have faith. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and here was a place where they welcomed questions. And, you know, I arrived there and it's obvious I was not a Christian. And they, you know, most Christians would you know, um, push me away when I started asking questions. Whereas Labrie was like, oh, cool. You want to stay? Hey, I see you have a lot of questions. You want to stay? And that's how it was back then. It was uh, back in the hippie era. It was very open-ended. And if they had a free bed, they'd just say, hey, you want to stay? So I did. Uh, so that's how I became a Christian, actually, was, was through apologetics. And the, the, the coming back to your question, then, is... Um, because I went through several years as an agnostic and I did see the dead end of, of atheism, I did see that there's no, there is no hope. You know, Paul says people, what's that verse where Paul talks about people without hope in the world? Yeah. I did see how dark it was. I did see, I mean, even, you know, Sean Paul Sartre, the existentialist philosopher says, you know, uh, there's no objective morality. We're condemned to be free. And people say, well, what do you mean condemned to be free? I thought freedom was a good thing. No, not if you're an existentialist, because what it's saying is, I don't have any idea if what I'm doing is right or wrong, good or bad, harmful or beneficial. I have no guidelines. I'm making it up as I go along. That's a terrible darkness. It was horrible. Yeah, that's a I recipe had... for chronic anxiety, you know? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> So I understood exactly what Sartre meant when he said you're condemned to free, free. It was a kind of condemnation. So anyway, all that to say, because of all that, I have an appreciation for Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so beautiful. It's such a yeah. beautiful worldview. It has, um, it, it's so life-giving. It's so affirming that, you cannot tell people, you can't tell people, hey, you know, maybe you should just leave the faith for a couple of years. <laughs> you know, you can't say that, but you want to see if, you, can you recreate this, this for people? Can you recreate them for them some sense of yes. how wonderful Christianity is compared to the other options out there? You almost, people sometimes afraid, I got this question just the other day about apologetics. Somebody asked me, well, you know, aren't you afraid that if people study apologetics, they're gonna lose their faith? And I'm like, it's the opposite. You know? No, you should learn about non-Christian worldviews and you'll come to appreciate Christianity so much yes. more. Oh, I've read Nietzsche a few times recently yeah. and it just, which is, I mean, I, I so appreciate his honesty. I mean, really he was the mm -hmm. first person to call the Enlightenment's bluff and basically say all this stuff about reason and human rights and some version of morality that just changed sex is nonsense. Like follow your worldview down. Yes. And, you know, and it, but that's where nihilism comes from. I mean, it's mm -hmm. utterly dark and brutal. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. So often I resonate with, you know, what Peter said to Jesus after that very hard teaching, where else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life, you know? Such a great job of capturing that. Well, Dr. Piercy, thank you so much for being with us. For all of you listening, I can't recommend her book, Love Thy Body, enough. She's written a number of beautiful books. They're all wonderful. But this book in particular is so well written, so full of both kind of very brilliant cultural analysis but and historical background, but with stories that go to the heart. So thank you for your courage, for your wisdom, for your intelligence. I know that a mind like yours that has all of that sitting in your memory banks, I mean, you don't prep for a conversation like this, it's on the fly. That is the result of decades of dedication to your craft as a professor and thinker. So thank you, we honor you, we bless you, and uh, hope to see you again. Thanks so much for listening to today's conversation. If you want to go deeper, this is just scratching the surface. Feel free to pick up a copy of my new book, Live No Lies, available wherever books are sold. There's a link in the video notes. Also, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel to just stay up to date on new material coming from me with this podcast and more in the future. And finally, I just want to say thank you. This entire podcast and video series was brought to you by our partners at World Vision. 
who are doing great work all around the world, in particular with the most vulnerable, but have just started to kind of move into the arena of caring for pastors. Pastors are, man, just facing a lot in the last year or two, in particular with a global pandemic, but so much more, a lot are feeling beat up and burned out. And World Vision partnered with Danielle Strickland, who's a friend of mine and a great teacher and writer and thinker, to put together a new resource called Soul Care Prayer Rhythms, which is kind of an intro to how do you keep your body and your soul alive in a time like the one we're living into. You can follow the link in the video notes for more information to access this resource for yourself. And again, thank you so much to our partners at World Vision who made this possible. All right, have a wonderful day and peace to you all.